Last week, we opened up with Psalms chapter 34, verse 15, that says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. It's good to know that, that his ears are open to their cry. We also read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, that says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we kicked off a new series called Pray Anyway. And in this series, we want to explore how the hustle and guilt, how to pray and the struggle with doubt become barriers to prayer. But by understanding what the Bible says about prayer, we can learn the priority of prayer and God's love. And we can continue to trust God when prayer doesn't seem to work. How many here are waiting for a prayer? You've been praying something for a long time, right? Is there anyone that's been praying? I'm believing for something in my own life and in my family's life as well. Can we continue to trust God even when prayer doesn't seem to work? And Pastor Carlos shared with us how prayer is simply talking to God and making time and space to let God speak to us. See, prayer is the first communication. Uh, today, we have our, next, uh, our new members class. If you are someone that would like to become part of our Revive Church family and begin to serve and learn about the vision of this house, we do have a, a class today at 2 o'clock. We'd love for you to, to go get something or refreshments. We will have refreshments and come on back. But in our new members class, uh, we do share one of our church values, which is we pray first. And it's a church value that we, we want to develop as a culture, as a behavior within our team, within, our, within our, our dream team, our staff, our pastoral staff, is that we pray first, that at Revive, prayer is our first response, not our last resort. See, beyond simply asking God for things, our goal in the Christian life is to know and to be known by God. And as in any relationship, we communicate, we talk, we listen. So the relationship with God is cultivated in prayer. It's cultivated in prayer. How many have started a project as a believer? Have you started a project uh, and, and you're, you're, you're so excited about it, you're passionate about it, you're ready to jump right in it, you start planning this and that, but you haven't prayed yet? You, you completely forget? And it's not until we come into a, a roadblock or into something that's difficult, something that may be challenging, where we may stop and remember like, oh God, God help me through this, like help me through all this. But can we at Revive become a group that prays first before everything? That the moment I wake up, my, past, uh, my dad said this morning, he goes, man, would it be something if we wake up on a Sunday morning and, and prepare ourselves by saying, God, today, save people. God, today, bring people back home. God, today, reconcile people. God, today, let people know that they're not alone. Today, could that be a prayer that we can all do individually every Sunday in preparation for what God's going to do in this room today? Right? But a lot of times, natural in prayer, what we do is we ask things. We come with a grocery list of things. Nothing wrong with that, but that's just in our nature where we need help. That's when we ask. At least, and it's in a private sense, you know, because it's just going to God. We can be prideful to ask help from people, but it's God's like, God, it's me. You know, you don't, you know I'm going through this situation. You know, you know I, I'm desiring this. You know that I'm longing this. You know that I need this. And, and a lot of us, we have those prayers every single day. I include myself. But a relationship with God is cultivated in prayer. So today, I, I, I want to talk about the power of prayer. What is it and why it works? In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus tells his followers, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Wow, that's a, that's a different way to pray, saying, as I'm praying, I'm believing I already have it. Like, Father, in the name of Jesus, I have that job. I'm getting that call tomorrow. But can I keep trusting even if it hasn't happened? Can I keep trusting, though, it, does, it seems a little delayed? Can I say, God, I received this report in, 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 from the doctor, but God, I am healed in Jesus' name. Your word says, by your stripes, by what you did on the cross, I am fully healed in Jesus' name. That's a powerful prayer. That's believing in something that hasn't happened yet. There's immense 
power in the prayer of a righteous Christian. The knowledge that there is power in prayer is not new. Many of the greatest stalwarts in the Bible turned to prayer constantly because they understood what it could do for them. Today, thousands of people see miracles in their lives by tapping into this very same power in prayer. And this power of God, I believe in Jesus' name, is available to you right now in this moment. Amen? If you're taking notes, go ahead and write the title of my message into our prayer anyways, but preaching a message called From Ordinary to Extraordinary. Write that down, From Ordinary to Extraordinary. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to be here. We thank you for all that you've done from this morning up until this point, Lord. We thank you for already what's going to happen at the conclusion of this sermon. We thank you for what's going to be happening throughout this week and month, Father. Lord, we pray to you in Jesus' name, Lord, Lord, that you meet every need, Lord, that, that you're able to, 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 for people to feel and see and know and have an encounter with you in Jesus' name, Lord, so they know that our lives and our relationships is cultivated with you through prayer, Father. Let us walk out different than the way we walked in and let this message. Message, Lord, honor you and glorify your name in Jesus' name. Come on, we say. So, what is the power of prayer? See, there are many times we feel powerless in our lives, especially in the face of difficult circumstances. By ourselves, we can do nothing. The scriptures confirm this in John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. You can do nothing. You know, throughout my journey in life, you know, it, with my family, it's funny how whenever God gives me a revelation that's to me for my own personal faith walk with Jesus, I, it's some, for some reason, I, I, it's either you can look at it as like it's a test from God, something happens in my life that all of a sudden I'm just like, oh God, you're testing me, or, or God, why would you allow that to happen? And it's kind of like, you know, if you pray for patience, what ends up happening, right? Your patience gets tested, right? How do I build that fruit of, of, of patience if I'm not tested in something, right, that helps develop that within my life? My wife says I fail it every single day, right? Patience. But, but every time I've had a revelation in moments in my life, there's been specific times where I've run to my wife and I said, babe, oh my God, listen to this. And I'll read her a, a portion of the scripture. I said, man, I feel like God is telling me this, right, babe? And right after that, something happens. And I remember just, I, I'm like, God, I don't like to be utilized that way. But it, it seems like if I've received a revelation, if I've received something that God has given me comfort in and brought me peace, that the moment I walk out of these doors, when life impacts me, then I'm able to persevere and push forward because of what I just received. What, what does that mean? I can listen to what I'm preaching and teaching in this very moment, but I have to actually apply it the moment I step out these doors. Uh, we, we could fail and be like, oh man, I, I forgot what he said or, or this and that. Or we can look at it it's like, God, well, you just said that you are with me always. You just said that you're carrying me. You just said that I'm in your arms and I'm in your hands. You said that, you, that you, you, you hold me in your arms. All those things that the moment life circumstances arrive that are difficult, I can rely on God's word and what I've cultivated in my communication and prayer with him. And it lets me persevere and keep pushing forward. Amen. I remember when Jelani, my son, he's, he's right in front, he's 12 years old today, but not, not today, but he's 12 now, but, um, and when he was three years old, I, I remember we were in our house, and he was outside in the backyard, we had the door open, I don't remember just really exactly if it was just he went outside in the backyard, or if we just, you know, knew he was outside, I just remember that he started screaming like something was hurting him uh, in the backyard, and, and I remember I was in my office, and, and Maria comes out, and she's like, oh my God, and then we, we look what was happening, and he's three years old, he's just in his pampers, he's in the backyard, and he's just kind of like doing this, and it's a swarm of like hornets that were all over him. So what happened was a, a little hornet's nest fell to the ground. He was curious. He, he was started messing with it, and it, started, and it started stinging him all over his body. I remember my wife in that moment, she's allergic to bees and, and has those types of allergies that when she saw that, her, her immediate thought, not that it just went to fear, she just knows what can happen if it's not treated in the moment, right? So she's like, and I remember grabbing him and, and I didn't know what to do. We didn't have time to pull up my phone and Google search. What do you do if you get stung 12 times? Three years old. 
And I remember going into my room and, and, and I put him on the bed and, and he's screaming and crying. And as I'm looking at my son, he has welts that are starting to grow from his face, in his neck, right here on his cheeks, on his arms, in his chest. And everything's starting to welt up everywhere where he was stung. It's a scary thing. I'm looking at him and it's like, and he's just screaming and crying from what would have been the pain, the burning sense, whatever it was in that moment. And, and I didn't know what to do. For a moment, I, I kind of was just like, what, what a, I, I only knew what I could do from what I was taught, from what I've seen. I grew up watching my father pray almost every single day, bumping into him in an office going, oh, dad's praying, and this and that. So what did I do? I started to pray. How, how many been in a situation that's dire? You're like, Lord, your car shut off. And you're like, God, Jesus. Lord, right now. Father, the... The, the, what you've given to the, the man and woman, whoever it was that created this engine. You know, like just, you start praying all these things, Lord, just start bringing a juice into it. Wake it up, right? Some of us, we even put kind of demands that have like, a, you know, a result to it. Lord, if you do this, right? How many have prayed like that? Lord, if you just this one time, I promise I'll go to church on Sunday, right? He's like, he's like you said that 15 other times and you're going to keep doing it, you know? And I remember I just started to pray, but something was different in this moment because my wife and I, we, we named our children intentionally with meanings behind them. We, we specifically named them saying that when I call your name, this is what I'm declaring over your life. And his name is Jelani Antonio Lopez. And I said, Jelani, which means mighty and powerful. It's an African name. And I said, I'm looking at Jelani. I said, Jelani, what is your name? I remember looking at him, and he, and he was looking at me, and he was like, he's like, and he's three. He's three. And I said, what is your name? And he's like, ah, he's screaming. What is your name, right? If someone was to see that, they'd be like, call child services. <laughs> he's swelling all over, you know. I was waiting, you know, but we're in a room, and, I, and I'm saying, what is your name? And, and I said, and he's like, J -j you know, he's three, saying his first. And then I said, what's your full name? Well, I'm challenging him at three. Give me everything, first, middle, and last. And I said, your name is Jelani. You are mighty, and you are powerful. I said, your name is Antonio. You are worthy of praise. And I said, what's your last name? This is all happening in split seconds. Please don't think that we had like a 30-minute dilemma just sitting there, just, you know, you're like, and then he died. No, 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 we didn't do that. I, I'm, I'm looking, I say, and your last name's Lopez, which is wolf. It symbolizes power, cunning, strength, courage, family. And I said, that is what your name is. And I declare that over your life right now. Bring healing because you are mighty and powerful powerful bring healing because you are worthy to be praised being healing lord because you have courage you're strong and you may look at that as something like, that's kind of silly right i would have already been on webmd like trying to find out what's going on or or take them straight to the hospital can i tell you that the moment that i started doing that because see the bible says in philippians chapter 2 verse 9 when god referred to jesus that therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name so as i looked at my son i said that is your name but god we serve a God, that's a name above even your name, son. And that is what we're declaring right now in this very moment, that in the name of Jesus, you are healed. Just radical moments in my family that I'll never forget. I'm just looking at him, and he's, I remember he stopped crying. He's like, I, but I felt so much conviction as I said it, like saying, God, you have the power to do this. In the name of Jesus, you're healed. See, we need to remember, though, that it is not merely the word Jesus that possesses the powerful authority. Rather, it is the one behind the name Jesus. The reason for this power rests solely in the finished work of the cross. And I prayed in that name, in the name of Jesus, you are healed. See, we, we recognize the need for God's power. And this is the same power by which God created the heavens and the earth. It's the same power that parted the seas for Moses and that Jesus used to heal the sick and cast out demons. It was that power that raised Christ from the dead and brought a baptism of fire on the first Christians. That same power that when I declared healing over my son, I saw with my very own eyes the swelling of every single one of those things go down and disappear completely. Now, you might call me crazy. It was a revelation in that moment that his power is real. After that, we Google search, what do we do? <laughs> Go ahead and give him some, you know, medicine for this and allergy medicine for this. But I saw with my very own eyes what was swelling start to go away. 
See, Paul tells us, or before I get that, I need you to understand, all these miracles happened through the power of prayer. Moses prayed before Yahweh. Jesus prayed to the Father for miracles. The early Christians prayed together in the upper room, whether it was Daniel in the lion's den or Elijah before the false prophets. Prayer constantly served the important figures of the Bible. And we can harness that same power in our lives today. God gives us this power through the Holy Spirit. See, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 19, Paul tells us that I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his comparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength. See, our heavenly father gives us this power through his son, Jesus. There is power in Jesus' name. How many believe that? Amen? In John 14, verse 13, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's a book called The Power of a Praying Woman. And, uh, and I saw this quote online from Stormy O'Marsh, and she says, We have to put our expectations in the Lord and not in other things or people. See, prayer works because God wants our complete dependence on him. He wants us to recognize that without him, we can't transcend our limitations. God is the source of our fulfillment. He is and wants us to make him the answer to our longings. Prayer draws us into a deep relationship with God, and our prayer life brings us closer to him through honest communication, just as any child does with their parents. So what does it achieve? See, prayer changes us first. In our busy lives, too often, we don't pray enough. Or we pray for our most pressing needs and treat God as a genie, right? Deep, intimate prayer draws us close to the heart of, of the Father, the heart of God. It helps us become more like him. Prayer lets us hear the Father's voice and direction. It inspires us and gives us answers. It reveals our flaws and perfects us. It is an avenue by which we can repent and be forgiven for our sins. And as we share our deepest longings with God, we change and become the people God wants us to be. There is power in prayer. See, like right now, for the past month, we've been believing for a new building, right? We, we're renting this place. This is a place that's rented. We've been blessed by the pastors right here next to us in this Korean church that have allowed us to transform this. When we took this over, none of this was here. None of the stage, none of, I mean, it was just completely, just none of that in the back was, nothing, that room for Revive Kids was, it was just an empty space. We walked in there, I remember my dad and I walked in, and we came all the way to the front, there was a little small, like, makeshift, makeshift stage, it actually uh, started from right here, the stage. The stage ended right here. So it'd be like right here. And so we, we expanded it to allow us to do things with our arts and with our worship. And, and so we've been faithful, I truly believe, with what God's allowed us to have throughout this season. Right? We've been faithful throughout the heat. We've been faithful throughout the limitations of, of, of rooms. Our kids, we've said it, they don't fit anymore. And, and if you weren't here last week, uh, uh, we, we had a beautiful testimony to hear that, that the pastors at the Korean church right next to us have, have granted us to, to have two rooms on Sundays here very soon for our older kids to go over there to, to really offset and, and kind of give space over here. I know, yeah, that's, that's amazing. So when you pray, I want you to pray for that church right there next to you. Pray for those pastors, for their team, for their staff, that God does miraculous things because of what they're doing right here for us. And so, so hearing these things, we've seen God do the miraculous. We're in a position as a church where we are not in debt. We're not in debt. We're under three years and we're not in debt. God's allowed us to compile resources to prepare and get ready for the next. Because of your generosity, because of your giving, because of what you, God's putting through you and what you've placed in your heart to give to this house, we are preparing and making way so that when the time comes and God says, now we're ready to purchase, we're ready to invest, we're ready to do something to get us to what God wants us to do. Now you may question in your mind, what kind of prayer is that? Why do you want bigger? The thing is, it's not that we want better. The thing is, we just need more space. You're like, well, there's more people that fit in here. Yeah. We can only have 300 chairs in this room right here, legally. 
Erase that online if you're seeing, please. We're already almost at capacity. Our kids is already at their capacity. We need more rooms to do ministry. This church is open almost every day. Prayers on Monday. Worship on Tuesdays. Wednesday, there's workshops. There's, there's different things and happening meetings that happen. Thursday, our arts meet. Friday, a uh, day off every now and then. But then there's stuff that happens here. Saturday, there's now arts rehearsals too. And there's things that happen even on Saturdays. And then Sunday, we are here giving God praise. It's every day. Amen? And so when we ask God, Lord, we need our own building. Can I raise your faith? Right? That if you've been a part of this house since the beginning or you just joined from the last six months, I challenge you and ask you to align your faith with ours. That when you give your offering today at the end of the service, we're not asking for no amount. We're not, no, no, just that when you feel that, Lord, I know where this is going. This is for the next generation. This is for the next, this is for the kids. This is for what God's going to do in store for this. All under three years as a church in this house. The city hasn't recognized us yet, but we are probably the fastest growing church. And it's not to boast about it. It's not to be like, yay, that's not what we ask, but it's something that we prayed from the beginning. That we say, God, if you say 70 people, as my dad said this morning, we're content. If that's the capacity you want us. Father, we will do what we could do with those 70, and those 70 are going to do further more than what we could do outside these walls. But God, if you want to continue to increase because people need to hear about hope and the love of God and what he can do to transform you from the inside out, then God, we're going to be responsible with that. We're going to believe for that. And that's what we're going to ask and pray for. So I want to take a moment right now and pause. Can we just get our heart right right now and connect and say, Lord, we're going to pray for a new building. Can y'all do that with me right now? Come on, I dare you to stand to your feet if you want to do that with me. If not, if you're comfortable, you can stay seated. But can we pray together as a church family? Say, God, before the end of the year, you're going to show us, you're going to reflect you're going to reveal, you're going to make something happen that's going to do, and we're going to be able to occupy something already built. That's what we're believing for. God, we're going to occupy, and if it's not something we're built, it's not of a lack of faith. God, we're going to continue mounting up the resources to get ready to build, to get ready to buy, to whatever it may be, but we have to be a church family that believes together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord Jesus, as we declare for a new building, Lord. Lord, we don't just say it because we just want it, Father. We are seeing the need, Lord, and ministry is, is, a, is the, the opportunity to serve a need, Father. And we just ask you, Lord, as you continue to expand us, Lord, that we're able to give, Lord, a ministry with excellence, Lord Jesus, Lord, with the space that is required. Lord, we ask you that all that you've allowed us to do in this house, Lord Jesus, that it's already going to be a blessing for the next house that occupies it after us. Father, we're believing, Lord, for that building in our city. Lord, a building, Lord Jesus, that's been separated, has been set apart, that is anointed and ready to be given and placed into our hands. In Jesus' name, Father, we are believing for it. We are calling for it. Lord, we know, Lord Jesus, that if it happens and it doesn't happen, Lord, we're believing and we're trusting in you, God. And we thank you for your yes. We thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for the past victories. We thank you for all those you continue to send, Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the equipment and the equipment and all the, all the resources that have arrived into our hands. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you help us govern it, that you help us steward it well. Lord, that when, we, when you say yes and you open that door, we walk right in and we occupy in Jesus' name. We're believing for it before the end of the year in Jesus' name. Come on, we say amen, amen, amen. See, there's, there's beauty in believing for a miracle that hasn't happened yet. You can stay. You can stay. There's beauty in believing for a miracle that hasn't happened yet. So every week, we're going to come together and do a collective prayer until it happens. Amen? Y'all believe in that with me? See, Jesus Christ himself teaches us the power of collective prayer. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus says, If two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by Father in heaven, by my Father in heaven. He even gives the template of the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer to show us how we must pray. Faith in collective prayer is encouraged, 
Throughout the Old Testament, collective prayer is demonstrated. In some cases, even national prayer is depicted in Scripture. God lays out specific guidelines for the Passover for the nation of Israel and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. And in, and in James 5, Christians are encouraged to pray with each other in times of sickness and affliction and suffering. I, I love the prayers of the Bible. They shape my own prayers more than anything else. I love the prayers of Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 through 11 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 through 21 and, and chapter 3 verse 14 through 19 and Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 through 12. R write those down. You can look them up later. But I love the prayer of Jesus in John 17 and I love the whole book of Psalms which is the inspired prayer book of the church, filled with such a range of emotions that, the, that cry out of our heart and almost any experience can find words in the Psalms. But the prayer in the Bible that has gripped many people, many of us, the most as we're preparing for this series is the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. And it says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. See, the Lord's prayer is very true to life in this sense. Life is a combination of spectacular things and simple things. In almost everyone's life, there are breathtaking things and boring things fantastic things and familiar things, extraordinary things and ordinary things, awesome things and average things, exotic things and everyday things. That's the way life is. And looked at one way, that's the way the Lord's Prayer is, almost everyone notices that it has two parts. The first part, verses 9 through 10, has three petitions. And the second part, verses 11 through 13, 11 through 13 has three petitions. The first three petitions are God's name, his kingdom, and his will. That's what it's saying. God's name, God's kingdom, and his will. It says, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, we are asking God to bring about these three things. God calls your name to be hallowed, to be made holy, consecrated, to be greatly revered, to be honored. God calls your kingdom to come, calls your will to be done as is done by the angels in heaven. The second three petitions are food, forgiveness, and holiness. So glad you're listening to our podcast. And we're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful. And you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. I'm just going to give you a brief because next week we want to dive a little bit more in this, but he says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You can see the difference, right? And feel the difference. Between these two halves, the first three petitions are about God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. The last three are about our food, our forgiveness, and our holiness. The first three call our attention to God's greatness, and the last three call attention to our needs. The two halves have a very different feel. The first half feels majestic and lofty. The last half feels mundane and lowly. In other words, there is a correspondence between the content of this prayer and the content of our lives. The big and the little, the glorious and the common, the majestic and the mundane, the lofty and the lowly. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 
11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. See, I believe that means that the world and the human soul are glowing with wonders linked to eternity. And yet our ordinary and mundane experiences of this world keep us from seeing the wonders and from soaring the way we dream from time to time. And even us as believers who have the Holy Spirit of God, even we say we have this treasure in jars of clay. Our spirit is alive with God's spirit, but our bodies are dead because of sin. See, that's the way life is, and that's the way this prayer is. It is iridescent with eternity and woven into ordinary life. So when sports teams get ready, and you see them in the huddle. They're all, our Father, without in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They all said the same thing, but do they really understand what they're actually saying? It's become so common that even prayer has become common for us and no longer something that we take serious. Where we just like, God, this day be good, amen. God, let my job be good, amen. God, I hope she's not here today, Amen. This we do. We talk to him a little, a little fast, a little just. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how many of us are getting to a point where we're, we're moving from the mundane, and we're looking at something more serious and more in depth. When was the last time that I prayed for more than five minutes? Well, I literally said, God, I'm separating this time for you right now. I, I don't know what to say, because I've, I've done that. I mean, I've done that. I, don't, I just don't know what to say, God. Um, because when you're there quiet in your thoughts you're going to say something eventually that's the way life is that's the way this prayer is see verse 9 he's saying Father cause your great and holy name to be honored and reverenced and esteemed and treasured above all things everywhere in this world including my heart He's saying in in verse 10, and cause your glorious, sovereign, kingly rule to hold sway without obstruction everywhere in the world, including my heart. He's saying in verse 10, and cause your all wise, all good, all just, all holy will to be done all over this world the way the angels do it perfectly and joyfully in heaven and make it happen in me. That's the breathtaking part of the prayer. And when we pray it, We are caught up into great things, glorious things, global things, eternal things. God wants this to happen. He wants your life to be enlarged like that, enriched like that, expanded and ennobled and soaring like that. He wants us to pray a prayer to say, God, what is your will for this week? God, that when I step in through my job, Lord, give me the opportunity to share my testimony. God, make way for me to let someone know about Jesus. God, what was the last time we actually prayed? Lord, give me the opportunity to share about your love. Lord, let it be reflected within me that that the moment difficult decisions come in my job or, or in school or that difficult teacher, God, help me in my response to glorify your name. Come on, can we pray with a prayer that's majestic to say, Lord... Let your will be done. That's a selfless prayer. Because you're not asking. See, but here's the thing. There's the second part. Because then we pray in verse 11, Father, I'm not asking for the bounty of riches. I'm asking for bread. Just enough to give me life. I want to live. I want to be healthy. And to have a body and a mind that works. Would you give me what I need for my body and my mind? Then we say in verse 12, and Father, I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven every day. I can't live and I have no desire to hold any grudge. I know I don't deserve forgiveness and so I have no right to withhold it from anyone. I let go of all the offenses against me. Please have mercy upon me and forgive me and let me live in the freedom of your love. And of course we know now what Jesus knew when he said, when he said also say to this in his death, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out of for many of the forgiveness of sins. See, when we pray for forgiveness we expect it not merely because God is our father because our father gave his son to die in our place I'm trying to teach you something today 
Because Jesus says, this is how you pray. He says in verse 13, and Father, I don't want to go on sinning. I'm thankful for forgiveness, but Father, I don't want to sin. Please don't lead me into the entanglements of overpowering temptation. Deliver me from evil. Guard me from Satan, from all his works and all his ways. Grant me to walk in holiness. See, that, that last part, that's the earthly part of the prayer. The mundane, the daily, the nitty-gritty struggle of the Christian life. We need food and forgiveness and protection from evil. Jesus wants us to feel the fatherhood of God as an expression of his readiness to meet our needs. See, next week we'll talk more about the Lord's Prayer and and break down these six petitions, but I want to remind you and remind us today that there is power in prayer and you can begin today. See, the Bible has numerous scriptures and stories about the power of prayer and how it works in people's lives. See, Hannah's powerful prayer in, in 1 Samuel is a good example. And it's, it's, it's how this power works. Hannah was married to Elkanah who loved her deeply. And however, Hannah was barren. She couldn't give him a child. And her story, her deep longing for a child drove her to despair. She cried out to God in prayer to bless her. And he did. The birth of the prophet Samuel made Hannah sing a song, a beautiful song of praise in response to the answered prayer. Her story demonstrates the Lord God's omnipotence and how he does hear us when we pray and that he does love us. So he hears your prayer. He hears your plead. He hears what you desire. And he responds to our faith. See, God hears our prayer requests, and I close with this. And God answers them too. He is a holy God, and he wants us to strive to be like him. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus explicitly asks us to be perfect like the Heavenly Father is perfect. Prayer can help us have the strength and power to be righteous. Through righteousness and the grace of God, we are able to use the power of prayer in every aspect of our lives. We won't be perfect, but through prayer we become perfected. God asks us to abide in him through our Bible and prayer life and that we can ask him for anything that is good If we don't abide by God's word and follow his precepts, then we are powerless. It says in James 5, 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Amen? It's powerful and effective. He takes what you're facing and going through that to many people may look ordinary. And with your prayer, God can do something extraordinary. He takes what looked like was never going to happen, but your faith and your prayer and your believing, God takes what looked like wasn't going to happen and begins to open doors and breakthrough begins to happen in your life. But see, as I cultivate prayer in my life, it starts with a relationship with Jesus. I can't just pray for just what I want. God is saying, do you have a relationship with me that you, that you can be capable of honoring me and, and worshiping and praising me the way the first three petitions are? Where I'm calling out what he's done before he's able to do it for me. It starts with relationship. I can't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and not have communication and talk and grow. It's through communication and those hour-long conversations and those 2 a.m. late-night phone calls where I start developing a stronger feeling for the person to be like, I want to know you more. I want to be with you. I want to be by your side. I start falling in love. All of a sudden, things be, I want to be with them all the time. And that is what God desires in a relationship with you. A lot of us, we only respond when we're going through something and God is saying, that's all you need me for. I'm not just a genie that you just rub on to say, this is what I need for the day. I want to have a relationship with you and a relationship is only cultivated through prayer. It's through taking moments and saying, God, I'm here. 
Come on, I challenge you every day that when you wake up, don't just grab your phone first to see what's happening throughout the other people's lives or, or even in your own count. What, can you just take a moment, even myself, challenge to say, you know what, as soon as I wake up, I'm giving God thanks for the day. I'm going to pray for my day. Say, Lord, visit with me, protect me, guide me. Lord, keep me healthy today. Guide my children when they go to school. Can, can, can you keep me and my finances in order? Hold that together. Lord, protect me from things I'll never know you protected me from. Lord, give me word for this week. Lord, help me through my health. Help me find and be able to cultivate. Help me. Can we make prayer a priority in our lives so that we can cultivate a life that we can refer to whenever we're going through despair? Because as I'm praying and, and growing my relationship with Jesus, the moment it gets tough, I know who to turn to. The moment it gets difficult, I know what his word says because it's something I've already cultivated. So when it gets painful, I can say, God, I already know that you have me in your hands. You already gave me that comfort last week. God, I already know that you're going to open this door. You already gave me that comfort this morning because I'm speaking to you. Ask any female in this room today that if your husband or your boyfriend doesn't call for a week, how are you going to feel? Just ghosts you. You're just like, why hasn't he called me yet? What is going on? Why, why is he not reaching out to me? Like, what is going Where are you? Where you been? Who you with? You start asking every question. You'll go crazy. You'll get in your car. You'll go look for him. You'll go driving. Show up to his job. Where is he? Where's he at? Show up to his house. Where's that? Go to his mom's house. Go to his best friend's house. I'm looking for you. Doesn't feel good, right? Man, but when we do that with God, we just show up today. And I'm not going to talk to you until next Sunday. And it gets tough on day Wednesday. You're like, oh, hey, God. He's like, could you imagine if God actually said it? See, because the demons say it. He was like, who are you? I don't know who you are. Could you imagine there's a, there's, a, there's a story in the Bible where all of a sudden a man was possessed. And the friends came and one was filled with God. The other one wasn't. And the one who wasn't locked up to him. And, and please, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Walks up and he says, in the name of Jesus, remove. And the demon looked back at him and says, who are you? you imagine that? That's cold-blooded. The demon looked at and said, who are you? I don't know who you are. You don't give me fear. I'm not scared of you. But when you have prayer in your life, when you make it a priority in life, I can walk into a room and say, in the name of Jesus, you are in this place. I can walk into a hospital room and say, God, in the name of Jesus, let your will be done. We are praying for healing in Jesus' name. I can go into an assembly room. It doesn't matter where we may be because of the God that's inside of me. There's a power in our prayer to say we declare things that haven't happened yet. And I have the faith that it will happen. That's why we're believing for certain things to say, God, because of what you've already done, what I've experienced, what you've done, what I've seen you do, my faith is aligned to that. I want to abide in you and because I abide in you when I speak, things have to move. It says all it takes is the size, your faith as a mustard seed to tell a mountain to move. That's all it takes. And some of us, we're trying to analyze it and we're trying to like, remember how, does that, how is that possible? God is saying, man, if it just takes a little bit of faith, that's what it's capable of doing. Imagine full sold out all in everything inside every fiber of me faith what it's capable of doing You can never tell somebody no that it will never happen with someone that's faith like that I've seen it with my own eyes of someone who's believing for healing for something Knowing that it is no way the percentage to see something turn around for that healing is literally just slim to none It is not even possible It'll literally take a miracle to actually happen and that person just not moved by that diagnosis to say It doesn't matter what that says in Jesus name. I am healed I'm healed I close with this because it was powerful what my dad said this morning. See, because you can walk in the footsteps of the Savior and testify to the world that there's power in prayer. You look ordinary, but 
when God's in it, it becomes extraordinary. The media doesn't have this verse, but in Matthew 5, 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and while he was set, this is Jesus, his disciples came unto him. He says, seeing the multitudes. See, the multitudes only wanted to receive. They never gave back in return. The disciples received and gave back to him. See, while the disciples were at his feet learning, the multitudes were busy chasing after things, things they would leave behind when they died. Could it be that the church today is full of multitudes and a lack of disciples? How many of us are going to the feet of Jesus and saying, Jesus, I'm here to soak it all in. Lord, I want to learn from you. I want to live a life according to what you have in store for me. See, a lot of you, you heard that and you're thinking, oh my God, i got to give up so many things. And, and it brings that quote to me. It says, don't judge me because you sin different than me. That's just an excuse. And the reality is, is that the gospel is something that confronts and impacts the heart of people to no longer sin. It's a commitment to say, God, I am here for the long haul. I'm here until the end of my life. I'm believing that you died for me and I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. That's what it means to carry my cross. It's literally saying I'm carrying this instrument of death. I'm carrying what represented death and I'm holding on to it until the day that I die. I will serve Jesus. I will hold on to it. I'm not going to chase a career, chase to be an artist, chase to be something that I'm not. God is calling us. God is calling you. The time is now. You've been anointed. You've been So, are you a multitude or do you want to be a disciple do you only come when you need something or do you come saying Lord I'm ready to learn I'm, I'm at your feet I'm here for you God I only need you I, I only want you I don't know my mom doesn't want you my dad doesn't want you my friends want nothing to do with you God I know this hurts I know it's a cost but you said it, Jesus. And so I decide to follow you. What do you want, God? Our Father who is Lord in heaven, hallowed be my name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as you forgive our transgressors. Can we pray, say, God, your will be done. Lord, you you first, God. You, God. Not my business. Not my talent. You. See, some of y'all are like, I don't know. I don't see it yet. Well, the title of this series is called Pray Anyway. It's time to just start praying. Start believing for things you haven't seen. Start declaring and changing things up. Because you've been doing it in your own way. It's not working. God says, without me, you're nothing. It says, abide in me. You become something. Pastor Rick Pina says, you can either 
allow your day to order your prayer or you can let your prayer order your day. Say, God, what's your will? That changes everything because he knows what you need. He does. He knows what you need. He knows what you long for. He knows what you desire. He knows what you've sacrificed for. I posted something today that really was convicting hearing my dad preach. I'm a family of five with three kids. And I need God just like you. And I recognize when I start measuring what I've lost because I follow Jesus. I've lost friends, best friends that I've been with all my life. I'm the only one out of all my friends I grew up with that's serving God today. The only one that I know of. And the ones that I'm still acquainted to that have you a little, that put man in, in the forefront to say because of who man is and what he's done and what they're doing, I won't follow God. How ignorant does that sound? That you decide to come to a church and say, you know what, all they want is money. All they want is this. I'm sorry that somebody hurt you. I'm sorry that you saw it just a different way. God has challenged us not to build this church around a man, but to build this church around the presence of God. And when you build it around the presence of God, we receive accountability to be who God called us to be. And so you'd rather lose your life and say, I'm waiting for the apology. The apology may never come. I mean, people are dead right now in a grave and they have no idea that there's debt on them because they're waiting for that dead person to forgive and to say sorry. Forgiveness is for you to be free. Forgiveness is for you to move on even if you never see the justice served for what they did to your life. It's okay, you leave it in God's hands. That's what prayer does. It cultivates peace, it cultivates joy to say, God, I don't know how to say I'm sorry or I don't know how to give forgiveness. But what does he say there? Jesus says, forgive me in the same way you forgive others. So that's what Jesus is telling us to do. There's an immense power in daily prayer. Jesus tells us that with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do great things as he did. Jesus is our role model to be able to tap into this power. We need to look internally at ourselves. Do I wake up and pray as he does? Do I fast and resist Satan like him? Am I holy? Do I love my brothers and sisters the way he does? You can walk in the footsteps of the Savior and testify to the world that there is power in prayer. Come on, bow your heads right where you're at. Father, we just come to you in this moment. Thank you for these moments and for this word. Lord, as I place it in your hands, as it was being prepared, <clears throat> I place the result in your hands, believing, Lord Jesus, that it reaches who it needs to be reached. Lord, touch your people. Lord, to receive conviction, not condemnation, conviction to be like, I need to fix my life. I need to start doing the right thing. I need to stop being prideful. I need to let this go to God. Because we all know what God's capable of. But it's hard to release it because we're in pain or we've been rejected or been betrayed. I believe in the name of Jesus today that it reaches who it needs to reach touches what needs to touch to bring comfort and fulfillment that when they say yes to you God life begins to change in Jesus name amen let's all stand to our feet I just want to do a prayer and a call <clears throat> a relationship with Jesus is cultivated with a life of prayer You may not hear God or you may not hear the answer. You may not know. But I'm telling you today, pray anyways. He operates in the extraordinary. He takes what we are and makes us greater than what we could ever become ourselves. And it's not for our glory. It's for his. And sure, I, I'm real passionate and real adamant about give your life to Christ. Put him first. I'm not telling you to become a monk. I'm not telling you to let go of and exile all your friends and delete it. No, no, I'm not saying that. 
the beauty of putting God first is that he gives you what you need. But not only that, he's above and beyond God. He gives you more. He arrives in a way that you would least expect. That's what he does. You may be praying for it one way and you're like, God, you bless me with even more. There's people in the room that have that testimony. You've seen what God has done in your own life where you prayed specifically. That's, that's why I, I know God is a God that, that he does. He, he's a wow factor, God. We're praying for a building. To, you know, we may have specifications in our mind of what it may look like or, or at least what we need inside of it, but God already knows. And when he arrives and shows up to do it, it's going to be something that we're all going to be on our face being God. It was only you that did this. Pastor Mike Todd says it's crazy until it happens. It sounds crazy until it happens. When we launched in November 2020, people called us crazy. It's not going to grow. It's not going to It's not going to happen. Look at the harvest today. It's only God. So we have a choice to make today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not in the next part. Let me wait till part three. No, right now. You have a choice to make right now to say, God, I want to cultivate a life of prayer with you. And it starts with giving my all to you. I've said this before. We are so easy to submit and accept Jesus as our Savior because he saves. Oh, hashtag Jesus saves. But to make him Savior, or I'm sorry, to make him Lord, it's a whole nother level. Lord is saying, I die to what I want. I die to my plans. I let go of how I want it to be and say, Lord, I make you Lord of my life. Guide me. The Bible says that he guides our steps. So do you want to make him Lord of your life? Because I love Jesus the Savior. But Jesus the Lord is who's going to take me from glory to glory. He's the one that leads and guides me. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you're at. If this message resonated with you, whether you're already a believer, but you feel far from God, or maybe you're not a believer today, you're saying, you know what, I, I want to accept Jesus today. I, I need to start this relationship with him. I, I want to start. I want to, I want to begin a, a journey with Jesus. I want to learn more about him. I, I want to grow with him. I want to see and hear of the wonders that you just talked about. In any extreme, if you feel far from God or you don't know him, I believe because we've already prayed that he is here. And he's here to welcome you and to, to hold you in his arms. And if that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to make things right in your life, to put him first. Come on, don't think about how you grew up or how church used to be. I'm talking about a fresh wind something new that maybe in the past it got lost with humanity but God is saying today is the day the Lord has made it's today it's another beautiful verse that says weeping may be for the night but there's joy in the morning I believe it's morning right now in Jesus name that's like a commandment joy has to come Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It has to come. It's a promise by God. If that's you, on the count of three, you're saying, today I'm receiving Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Or today I feel far from him, but I want to be close to him again. I want to reconcile, and I want to start a journey with him right now. If that's you, one, two, three, lift your hands. If that's you today, say, today.